namaste sate sarvalokashrayaya namaste chite vishvarupatmakaya namo dvaita tatvaya mukti pradaya namo brahmane vyapine nirgunaya <clears throat> Salutations to the absolute support of all worlds. Salutations to absolute consciousness that manifests as the universe. Salutations to non-dual reality that grants liberation. And salutations to all-pervading, attributeless Brahman. Well, good morning on this Academy Award Sunday. <laughs> I hope you don't have too much traffic to deal with on the way home. Um, this is a rather large topic for today. Modern science and our understanding of reality. So I cut it up into sections. We're just going to do part one today. Uh, and not that we're going to cover the entire universe and all the other parts either. But um, I want to give us an opportunity to think about things that we don't normally take time to in our hectic everyday world. This is not to provide any def definitive answers to anything, but to, just to kind of show uh, what kind of rumination, ruminations about the nature of reality um, is going on out there, uh, particularly in the scientific community. Um, but these ruminations overlap philosophy uh, for thousands of years. Natural f philosophy originally what is what was called nature, I mean, excuse me, what was called science now. Um, so they bifurcated in the 1700s, at least in the West. They never bifurcated in the East, I don't believe, until Western education got there. Um, and there are views that seem to be, people seem to think that uh, scientific and spiritual uh, teachings are radically opposed, but it seems that over the last 15 years or so, they're actually getting a lot closer together. Because some scientists have now embraced the possibility of an observing intelligence as being necessary for the manifestation or projection that is all of this uh, to happen. So, uh, that's kind of the basis, you know, what I, where I'm coming from in, in, in talking about this, this topic. I want to go back just a little bit, though, in time to uh, the, the beginnings of philosophy. In the West, that is in Greece, the literal meaning of reality also was meant the state of not being hidden, the state of being evident. That's one view. They also suggested that there is a truer reality <coughs> under the apparent reality. So they came up with these words, nomenon for real reality, true reality, and phenomenon for apparent reality. This is what we deal with all the time. We know a lot about that. And the Indian philosophers, however, who actually some of them predated the Greeks, um, respectively called these the unmanifest and the, and the manifest in, in one of their philosophies. And today, we typically refer to these views as transcendent and imminent. So these two views exist side by side for a long time. And they, they've been used as necessary in whatever discipline the discipline requires. So in Sankhya, for instance, which was the first organized philosophy in India, it goes way back, uh, I don't know how many thousands of years, because some of it was probably predated being written down, they actually considered that there were two real things. There was Purusha, which they called spirit, and Prakriti, which was everything else, that which, which we normally would say comes under the, the um, category of matter. So they, they just got around the whole question right in the early days by saying, well, there's two. You know, we're not going to say that they're opposed to one another. We're not necessarily. We're not going to say that 
one negates the other. We're not going to say that one supersedes the other. There's two, which, you know, now that I think about it, is kind of an interesting uh, way to solve, you know, this, this tussle that's been going on between those, those two views. Nowadays, well, and according to the, to the, the prevailing notion, okay, which, again, uh, coming from the Western side, um, the, uh, which was heavily influenced by the ancient Greeks, reality is considered the state of things as they actually exist, rather than as they am, uh, may appear or might be imagined to be. So reality includes everything that it is, has been, whether or not it's observed or comprehensible. A broader definition says everything that has existed, exists, or will exist. So reality then is restricted often solely to that which has physical existence or has a direct basis in it in the way that thoughts uh, do in the brain. Stuff, stuff then, is for all practical purposes primary and thus we use this word reality in everyday life. What is abstract in this, in this definition doesn't count because you can't have a bucket of love or give me three yards of grief. Anything that isn't measurable, in other words, is not part of this definition of reality. The minority opinion, as I've mentioned before, there are many who, in both East and West, was that the real was by definition the unchanging, permanent, infinite. So I want to look at some things here and see what 20th centuries had to say about it and a little bit about what the 21st century uh, has uh, turned a corner on. There's been, a, there's been kind of a turning point in the scientific community. So um, I'd like to start the... Uh, I have some slides for you. By the way, this is only the second time I've done a PowerPoint, so, you know, bear with me. Um, there's a lot I still have to learn. <laughs> about creating slides, about projecting slides, about uh, all of that. So when we talk later after the lecture, if you want to you know, make some comments or whatever about that, let me know, because uh, I'm still learning how to use this program. OK, today's topic is the universe. <clears throat> very, very succinctly. Um, there, I want, would like to start with a quote from John, uh, John Wheeler, um, who was a, uh, a physicist who was involved in the nuclear project in the United States back in the 40s, 50s, into the 60s. Um, and this is kind of a sort of a picture of the universe, um, at least in the galaxy. And he says, we live on an island surrounded by a sea of ignorance. As our island of knowledge grows, so does the shore of our ignorance. Very insightful. I mean, the more we know, the more we know we don't know. Um, and he put it in a very nice way. There's a lot of critiques of science, of the scientific method, which I'm not going to go into this time, because that could almost constitute a, um, a talk in itself. Um, it's not that it's, you know, that I want to you know, romanticize it or put it on any kind of a pedestal or something like that. But one critique that comes um, forward was put by Arthur Young, who crossed the border between um, hard sciences and biological sciences, and he says, science has become so fragmented into separate disciplines that it has lost sight of the unifying principle that the u uh, word universe implies. He's talking about this tendency for reductionistic, you know, cut it up into little pieces uh, and see how it works. You know, the fact that you can't put the pieces back together again doesn't seem to matter to a lot of them, but anyway. 
The basic structural bones of the universe are space and time. They are the necessary ingredients for causation among material objects. These come within the Indian concepts of prana, that is energy, and akasha, matter. In some sense, Indian philosophy took time, um, time, time to be the primary thing because its focus was on change. You know, there's a lot in, in, in uh, Indian originated religions on the, f the flux, how things constantly change. They never stop changing. Um, so they took time to be pri the primary category, whereas in the West, we seemed to concentrate more on the material aspect or the stuff because thingness seemed to be important. So matter was the big thing. Um, Albert Einstein was a real turning point in science, and he, he had a lot to say. He had a lot of things besides scientific things to say. There's a great book about him, uh, by him, his, on his opinions and ideas. Anyway, a human being is part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself as something separated from the rest a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison. So even though he's, he, he had some, somehow dealing with the kinds of mathematical shorthand formula equations that's, that these physicists have to do all the time. It kind of puts them into a, a dimension that we would c consider spiritual because they realize the limitations of that thing and, and how vast uh, the implications of these formulas are. Um, so this prism that he's talking about is ruled by what they call laws or constants. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the laws of uh, physics here, but I wanna just kinda tell you there's gonna be some amount of repetition here because I'm gonna be using quotes from different people and they kinda cover the same ground, but it's interesting to see how many of them, and there's, of course, this is just a selection, have had comments to say about uh, law. I want to start, however, with Swamiji, um, and this is a direct co quote from Swamiji. He he's tried in his day to be aware of what was going on in the cutting edge of, of science. Now, he passed away in 1902, and so he did not get to see Einstein's breakthrough, but he understood about how, the law, this idea of law that the physicists were dealing with. So he says, Swami Vivekananda says, law is a mental shorthand to explain a series of phenomena, but law as an entity does not exist. We use the word to express the regular succession of certain occurrences in the phenomenal world. <clears throat> so in other words, we, we we, we have observances and then we bring reason to bear on those observances. And then this Arthur Young, who I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, says, reason with its compulsion to set limits tends to block out the truth. Because it, it kind of short circuits any intuitive grasp for a lot of people, okay? So what I wanna do is talk about the evolution a little bit of physical laws here, and, and this is just a, a little summary. Um, there, was, there was Aristotle and all these Greek fellows um, that they relied on through the whole Middle, uh, middle Ages. So then we come to Sir Isaac Newton, and, but prior to Newton, this, the way they would explain things is, <coughs> it's a mystery, or God had something to do with it. <clears throat> so those are the kind of explanations that people were satisfied with. Now, when Newton comes on uh, the scene, he postulated fixed laws based on materialism. 
that is a reductionistic point of view. He did things like describe if you were to um, uh, lob a, um, a stone, he could predict the trajectory uh, depending on the force, how much force was behind it, where that stone would land, et cetera, et cetera. So he had laws of motion of physical objects. Now, this tendency to reductionism has not disappeared. It's still with us today, but I'm going to talk, as I'm going to say a little bit later, <clears throat> there are some people who are uh, breaking through that. Okay, after Sir, Sir Isaac Newton, of course, there were a number of other fellows who I'll refute refer to later in their particular fields, but Einstein was the big one. And he replaced these fixed laws that Newton came up with with relativity uh, because he used Max Planck's equations which replaced the quanta of motion or action as primary, rather than stuff, rather than material. Something moving, but what that thing is, we don't even know what that thing is, but movement is the primary thing. So that's what, what Einstein's uh, work is based on. Um, so he did a lot of things like thought experiments where you have, um, uh, if you're on one moving train and the other person is on another moving train and they're going in opposite directions, how do you calculate certain uh, certain things that go on between them, perceptions of, of distance, etc. cetera. Um, now, uh, one year after Einstein, this uh, Ludwig Boltzmann uh, passed away. Um, and he was an Austrian physicist and a philosopher. And his position was rather extreme at the time. And he says, when we state physical laws, what we are using is simply a series of linguistic rep representations of reality. In other words, there's nothing more than that. It's just a convenient way to refer to things so that you know what I'm talking about and I know what you're talking about it, but it doesn't actually describe anything that's really happening. Um, so we, in other words, we can't you know, rely on that e exclusively. Now, Newton says these labels, and they're just labels, um, relate in such a way that we can use them for predictive purposes. You know, that, that's it. We can't, we can't say that there's anything necessarily intrinsic in them. So he's, he's um, kind of stuck between uh, the, the, the Newtonian position, which came before Einstein, and Einstein that was so new to him because Einstein's work only came out a year before Boltzmann died. So. There's several other fellows in here, but the next one I want to talk about after that is Niels Bohr. Now, Niels Bohr was the fellow who came up with the idea of the, how the atom is constructed. You've got a nucleus in the center, which is a, has a positive uh, uh, charge on it, and you've got electrons running around the outside that have a negative charge. So he, he was like a really important guy at that time, and he was in this uh, group of physicists who came together and came up with, with what they call the Copenhagen interpretation. That means they had a lot of questions they couldn't answer, and so let's just sit down and decide, okay, how we're gonna do it. So he came, uh, they came up with somehow, this idea of quantum collapse and probability. Now, we, I think we all know that probability is the order of the day when it comes to uh, quantum mechanics uh, and but they couldn't explain for instance like in the in the in the uh, experiment it's a thought experiment again uh, that uh, Schrodinger which is called Schrodinger's cat you have a cat in a box is the cat dead or alive well you don't know till you look this was his his um, gross way of explaining what's going on in the quantum world. Same thing, you don't know whether a particular thing is a wave or a particle until you look. The light, 
Is, is it a wave or is it a particle? Well, they found out later that it isn't really a particle at all. It's what they call a quanta. But anyway, that's beside the point. Um, the, the point I want to make about Niels Bohr is it's really funny, and I'll have a little uh, quote from him later on. The observer in this quantum mechanical world that he's looking at is still outside the system. The observer is looking at it and, and making a decision. Is it on? Is it off? Is it up? Is it down? Those kinds of things. Um, and so that left them with the idea, this idea of quantum collapse, which is somehow the act of, act of observing something forces a conclusive condition, somehow forces matter to make a decision and show up in a particular way. And it was kind of mysterious, and a lot of physicists weren't really happy with it. Uh, but they lived with it for decades. Now, this last fellow I have in here, Christopher Fuchs, um, he's new. He's 21st century. And he's made, as I think, uh, I, I think he's going to become really important as time goes on. The wave function, he says, a single reality, objective reality, is an illusion. Quantum mechanics is a law of thought. He says, the wave function does not describe the world, the world, it describes the observer. Quantum mechanics is a law of thought. So he's bringing it back to, he is making the observer primary for the first time. And this very much reminds me of John Dobson, those of you who knew John Dobson, his contention that these so-called laws of physics are equations of Maya. Now, Maya is not something that exists out there. It's something that we do. We impose limitations. So this Christopher Fuchs, although he is in no way uh, coming up with or, or claiming to have any kind of spiritual insights or whatever, is coming extremely close to a self with a big S that we want to talk about as, as time goes on. Not so much today, but maybe another time. OK, a couple of other guys here. <clears throat> OK, let me continue with Fuchs before I go on to the other guy. One way to look at it is the laws of physics aren't about the stuff out there. Rather, they are our best expressions, our most inclusive statements of what our own limitations are. For example, when we say that the speed of light is the ultimate speed limit, we're saying that we can't go beyond the speed of light. One can imagine that eventually we'll have evolved to a stage, this is what he's saying, where we can take advantage of things that we can't now. We might call those things changes in the law of physics, but usually we think of the universe as this rigid thing that can't be changed. Instead, this is the contention that I, that I think is a real breakthrough. Methodologically, we should assume just the opposite, that the universe is before us so that we can shape it, that it can be changed, and that it will push back on us. We'll understand our limits by noticing how much it pushes back on us. He's putting in, in words something that I've thought for quite some time, which is that as long as we continue, that we, meaning scientists, continue to look for things, they'll continue to find things because the universe will manufacture things for them to find. Now, whether those things were there before the question was asked, who knows? <laughs> but you've asked the question, therefore, here's an answer. Okay, or here's a, so, so this, this comes very close to some things that other Thinkers like uh, uh, Pierre de Chardin and some others who've been around for a long time, um, which is co creativity, what they call on the dualistic side co creativity, that is, God and man sort of interact to, to create things. It's not just that God creates, it's that we both create together. So, this is what's the pushing back, what Fuchs is referring to as nature pushing back. We could say, you know, 
uh, God shaking hands, you know, with us and, and saying, oh, okay, so you want to go in that direction? Well, all right, fine, let's go in that direction. Let's see what we can, can uh, produce. Hoffman, he's a, he's a mathematician. Uh, just succinctly, physics tells us there are no public physical objects. Again, it's the observer. It's up to the observer. This slide. Let me see. Here's Arthur Young. The older concept of a universe made up of physical particles interacting according to fixed laws is no longer tenable. Those laws are not fixed. They change all the time. Therefore, it's kind of losing its connotation of being a law at all. Uh, rac action rather than matter is basic. Action being understood is something essentially undefinable and non-objective. Um, this is what Max Planck introduced prior to Einstein. So it has taken hold in a, in a, in a big way. Um, this is John Wheeler again. He's a very, very big name, even today in, in, in physics, though he was middle of the century, last century. The central lesson of quantum physics is clear. There are no public objects sitting out there in some pre-existing space. Quote, useful as it is under ordinary circumstances to say that the world exists out there, independent of us, this view can no longer be upheld. The only law is that there is no law. It's changed so much. This is one of the things that religious people, in their critique of, of science, come up with all the time. Well, you know, they keep changing their minds, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's not that they're changing their minds, it's that they're, they're learning more and more and they're finding out that the prior definitions are too limited and they have to redo it. This is why I think that we're going toward nixing the whole idea of law to begin with. Uh, this, is, this is from David Bohm, uh, who in another talk, I'll talk much more about him, but um, he's making a uh, his explanation of more or less the same thing we've been talking about to this point. Subatomic particles are able to remain in contact with one another regardless of the distance separating them. This is true. We know this experimentally. But that is not because they are sending some sort of mysterious signal back and forth, but because their separateness is an, an illusion. Now, a lot of scientists have said somehow, you know, you have these two um, subatomic particles and one can be on the other end of the universe, but somehow they've become in entangled and now they've been separated and yet when one I is discovered it's in a certain direction and the other's in the opposite direction, oh, they must be communicating with one another somehow, even if it's instantaneous and has nothing to do, it's beyond the speed of light, whatever. And he's saying, no, 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 no such thing. Um, their separateness Bohm says, it's an illusion to begin with. The ultimate nature, David Bohm says, of physical reality is not a collection of separate objects as it appears, but rather is an undivided whole that is in perpetual dynamic flux. Now, I don't think he came with this, up with these ideas totally independently. I'm sure he was very widely read in Eastern philosophies. Uh, but it's interesting that he was able to, to see from the, the scientific mindset uh, how prior existing ideas uh, from the East are able to shed some light on the problems that physicists are dealing with all the time. Now this is a quote from Ilya Prigojin who worked on dissipative structures which I'd like to talk about someday. Um, and uh, he was Russian. Uh, the threat lies in the realization that in our universe, the security of stable, permanent rules are gone forever. You know, it's funny, because some scientists are holding on to those stable laws, like, oh, no, 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 this is it. But, you know, it's, it's, it's quite uh, neurotic. <clears throat> 
We are living in a dangerous and uncertain world that inspires no blind confidence. Our hope arises from the knowledge that even small fluctuations may grow and change the overall structure. See, he, he dealt with these small changes. This is one of the works that he does. As a result, this is what's important. Individual activity is not doomed to insignificance. We may think that all of this stuff is, is making non-entities of, of us. And he's saying, no, quite the contrary, because small changes can make huge differences later. Now, I ask you, two weeks ago, did we have high school students leading a movement that is taking the whole country by fire? Small changes. These kids said, we're not going to stand for this anymore. And now, it's, it's a force. To the point where today, in, in the LA Times, they're recapping 50 years ago, 1968, the students at that time who said, you know, who took uh, action, that time they were dealing with the Vietnam War, but nevertheless, they changed things, and the kids now are going to change things too. So even in our own individual lives, if we take it that small, if we, if we decide to be helpful to someone who, is, uh, uh, who needs some assistance, if we decide to uh, go this way rather than this way, every decision that we make has a possibility of changing things in a, in a large way, particularly if it has societal implications. So um, this is this Ilya Prigojin is um, again kind of crossing a threshold from his his work with dissipative structures to human activity. He's saying that we can these things have, can. Uh, coincide or can, can there's a correlation okay we can correlate the work here with the work there okay so last comment about laws this is from Niels Bohr again physics is not in general about nature it is about nature exposed to our observations so even though he could say that he was still one of the guys who felt that the observer was not really part of the equation. He was, you know, like prior to prior to the 1950s, um, and things have changed a lot since then. But he's the, he's the atomic guy, so that's why we have pictures of the little atoms here. So we have a conundrum in physics. In in that. There are two pillars of modern physics. One is quantum mechanics, and the other is relativity theory, and they actually contradict one another. This drives physicists crazy. Um, this contradiction is not just in minor details, but is very fundamental, because quantum mechanics requires reality to be discontinuous, non-causal, and non-dual. Whereas relativity theory requires reality to be continuous, causal, and local. So these two taken together constitute a paradox. The existence of a paradox indicates that there's something awry in the theory. This is taken from, I believe, Susskind said this. This is where I got this thing. Susskind is a string theorist. So this is why scientists are looking for a supervening theory within which both of these will remain true. So something that will encapsulate both of these and allow them both to be true at the same time. Now I want to switch over to sort of philosophy psychology from this because we're talking about paradox. And uh, this is taken from Ken Wilbur, who is a transpersonal psychologist, but he was very, he's very, very into spiritual things also. He says, the most notorious paradox in the perennial philosophy is, spirit is the summit of being, the highest rung in the ladder of evolution. That is what we call transcendent. But it is also the wood 
out of which the entire ladder is made, that is the imminent. Spirit is the suchness, the isness, the essence of each and everything that exists. He concludes by saying, paradox is simply the way non-duality looks to the mental level. We're trying to figure it out, but we can't do it mentally. Spirit itself is not paradoxical. It is not characterizable at all. So I want to go on to some aspects of space-time as physicists currently understand it. Um, this is uh, Schrodinger. What we observe as material bodies and forces are nothing but shapes and variations in the structure of space and time itself. And back to Wheeler, the essence of Einstein's theory of gravity is matter tells space how to warp and warped space tells matter how to move. This picture is in two dimensionals, two, two dimensions, but as the title says, space is actually four dimensional because the fourth dimension is time. And you can't, it's a two dimensional picture, it would be great if it could be three dimensional, but that's as far as we can get. The, what I'd like to point out, however, is here, um, this is how they show a uh, how space warps and this is a artist artist's conception obviously you're not going to see little lines out there in space um, but they talk about it as a fabric like warp and woof it's got it and it's flexible and it moves well you know interestingly enough dig this I mean this blows this really truly I'm saying it's a small thing but it blows my mind the Hindus have used cloth to symbolize space for a long time. Cloth, fabric. Now where did they get that? You know, it just, it just, it blows me away. Um, from Einstein's general theory of relativity, gravity, therefore, I just want to put this out because I'm not going to talk about gravity, is not a field or a force on top of space-time, but a feature of space-time itself. Thus, the space-time continuum is actually warped and curved by mass and energy, a warping that we think of as gravity, resulting in a dynamically curved space-time. So you see how the curves are showing on this on this illustration. All right, I don't want to talk more about space because space I think we probably have a better handle on than this other thing that we've dealt with for e equally long period or longer, and that is time. You know, see, time is not an existent. It's not a thing at all. I want to paraphrase Swamiji, who I started with earlier, and stick in a different word. Time, as an entity, doesn't exist. Some cultures, whether you know it or not, don't even have a word for time in the abstract. They can say, you know, last year, or autumn, or this morning, or whatever, but they don't have a word for time in the abstract. Um, so that shows us how much of a, of a mental construct it is. In the West, the concept of time that has been prevalent is that it's relatively short. We take relatively short time frames, and it's linear. It goes in a certain direction, that's it. Once it's gone, it's past, it's behind you, and it's irreversible. In the East, uh, particularly in India, they had very long, I'm talking about philosophically speaking, very, I mean, astronomically long periods of time that they were used to thinking in, okay? and. They also had on the on this plane kind of 
uh, a very cyclical notion because, you know, let's face it, you go through the same seasons every year, it comes back around, things are rather predictable, you know when, when to plant, you know when to harvest, et cetera, et cetera. And I think they also had a notion, uh, although they don't particularly use the word, of it being kind of spiral. So in other words, they had this idea of yugas. And the yugas follow one another in a certain pattern. So every uh, fourth yuga, you're going to be in a, in a Kali Yuga again, like we are now, presumably, which is uh, the most degraded social uh, period, followed by a golden age, a Satya Yuga. And they, they had these ideas that continually uh, f follow one another, how societies continually follow one another. And then there's the scientific view of time, which is strictly that it's a kind of a useful thing for measurement. Uh, whether you're talking about nanoseconds or whether you're talking about light years, um, it's, it's necessary if you're going to do experimentation to measure the result. Now in Newton, Newton's time, the idea of absolute time and space had been superseded by the notion of time as one dimension of space-time, which we call it in relative, uh, special relativity, and of dynamically curved space-time in general relativity. If the speed of light is invariable and absolute, Einstein realized both space and time must be flexible and relative to accommodate this. That's why it's, he's always called, you know, that's why his theory is called relativity. Modern physicists do not regard time as passing or flowing in the old-fashioned sense, nor is time just a sequence of events which happen. Both the past and the future, future are simply there, laid out as part of four-dimensional space-time. So, as just as we are accustomed to thinking of all parts of space as existing, even if we are not there to experience them, all of time, past, present, and future, are also constantly in existence, even if we're not able to witness them. Time does not flow then, it just is. That time appears to flow arises purely as a result of human consciousness. Again, it's something we do. Here's uh, Einstein talking about time. People like us who believe in physics, it's interesting he uses the word believe, know that the distinction, is between, the distinction between past, present, and future is only a stubbornly persistent illusion. So he's commenting on the implications of his own work. Now, in, later on in the 60s, I believe, Richard Feynman, who is also an extremely famous physicist, says, it's not true that a free particle only takes one path that is a straight line. Instead, according to quantum mechanics, it takes all possible paths. It can do crazy things, like go backwards in time or go first to the moon. According to quantum mechanics, all these things can happen, but they happen probabilistically. So that means you have to send that particle out many, 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 many times in order to find the one that's going to go backwards in time or the one that's going to go to the moon first or whatever. You need large, large numbers to deal with probability. <clears throat> now, I want to talk um, a little, we're talking about time. And I want to skip to a, uh, another physicist who also straddled between hard sciences and biological sciences. And he came to be a little discredited. Some of these guys were really, you know, on the edge. He came to be a little bit discredited by his physicists later, but he had some very interesting insights. Um, he's the guy, by the way, Fred Hoyle is the guy who figured out you have the periodic uh, in chemistry, the, the periodic table that shows you where the elements are and you know how many 
uh, what their atomic weight is and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. He's the guy who figured out how uh, these elements are created in stars. And how when a stars go supernova and blow apart, that's where these elements are coming from. Okay, and then they agglomerate later and become planets and things like that. Okay, so Fred Hoyle was, was, had made some major contributions. And he asks a very important question. He's commenting on the works by Maxwell and Faraday. Now, Maxwell and Faraday existed way back in the early 1800s, I think. And they were dealing with electromagnetism. And um, Faraday was kind of a, a genius um, experimenter and uh, uh, inventor, in a way. But he, he didn't have the formal training. So he teamed up with this guy, James Maxwell, who was a, uh, had a mathematics um, background from university. And they together came up with some, at the time, astounding work in the field of uh, electromagnetism, which is, of course, still holds today. So Hoyle is asking a very Im important question. He says, he's referring to the fact that James Maxwell's equations show that information passes not only from past to future, but from future to past. Yet science ignores that. So he's asking a question. First he say, states, Hoyle states, nature is very parsimonious in the sense that where possibilities exist, they seem always to be used. This is what I liked about Hinduism. When I first came to it, it was like, whatever is possible, so, you know, they, they agree it's going to exist somewhere, sometime. You know, it, it was kind of, that also kind of blew my mind at the time. Okay, now Coyle's question is this. Can the reversed time sense be the only exception to this rule? Can the reversed time sense be the only exception to the rule that, okay, he's saying where possibilities exist, they seem always to be used. So this is his starting point. Hoyle continues, speculating, this is speculating, if events could operate not only from past to future, but also from future to past, the seemingly intractable, intractable problem of quantum uncertainty could be solved. Instead of living matter becoming, now he's switched, he's working in the biological side now. Instead of living matter becoming more and more disorganized, it could react to quantum signals from the future, the information necessary for the development of life. Instead of the universe being committed to increasing disorder, that is entropy, that's the main th thought, that the universe is gonna wind down and everything is just gonna become this, this homogeneous soup. Instead of the, the universe being committed to increasing disorder and decay, the opposite could then be true. Properly speaking, one should think in terms of loops in time, not in terms of cause and effect. Now this is, this is, this is he's, he's, he's cutting at a, <laughs> cause and effect is like, wow, the, such a stable idea that, you know, how do you challenge that? But he is, not in terms of cause and effect. Cause and effect becomes a convenient description only in special situations involving localities. Localities, yes. In here, if I throw something and it hits somebody, you know, that's cause and effect. Um, but not the universe as a whole. The essential point is that Hoyle says, there is no such inexorable flow from past to future. And in some situations, it may be essential for the future to interfere with the past in order to justify itself, although the future can on only interfere with the past through the subtle effects of individual quantum events, not through large-scale interference. So he's saying it's very small 
kinds of things. But that's all, in his view, that's all that's necessary to change the course of the evolution of life on a planet such as, such as ours. These considerations go a long way toward clearing up an exceedingly unsatisfactory aspect of the usual way of looking at things, according to which the sole purpose of the present appears to be to generate the future. In that view, nothing lasting is ever achieved because everything is discarded the instant it happens. On the other hand, here comes his speculation again, once the universe is seen as an inextricably linked loop, However, nothing can be discarded. Everything exists at the courtesy of everything else. Now, Swamiji understood this. He quoted, uh, he quoted William Blake, uh, the universe in a grain of sand. He, he totally understood how everything is inextricably linked. And most of the, you know, the spiritual realized masters uh, agree. Now, this idea of the future interfering with the past, uh, a lot of fiction writers have latched onto this idea. And it's become very popular in uh, movies and novels and things like that. Now, the first one I recall, and there may be many others, but these are just some that I know. Kurt Vonnegut, way back in the 50s, I think it was, who wrote his Slaughterhouse Five. It was about a guy who did not live his life sequentially, but it was all in different order. <laughs> um, Interstellar, which came out a few years ago, was about uh, time travel and relativity, uh, but then th loops in time and uh, humanity sending messages back to itself in the past. Uh, there's a th another one called Looper, which is about a guy who goes back and forth. And then Arrival, uh, Arrival uh, about the aliens who come and say, we're going to help you now because in 3,000 years you're going to help us that kind of thing. Um, they've taken it to the micro level, these fiction writers, I mean macro level, where um, it doesn't really operate according to uh, Hoyle, but it's interesting because they're exposing us to the idea that time may very well have these loops and the future very well may somehow be communicating with certain aspects of existence on, on this plane. The, uh, Hoyle says, the less recognized individual quantum events controlled from the future as when we make up our minds to do one thing rather than another can have a major influence. These future to past situations are so subtle that they tend to pass us by almost unnoticed. Um, this is a little bit like, what was it? Oh, it doesn't want to go backwards. Pierogine. Individual activity is not doomed to insignificance. Small fluctuations. Okay. <clears throat> now there's a, I can't remember his first name, but there's a uh, Hameroff. He's another uh, physicist or mathematician. I can't quite sure. He talks about backwards referral of time. How can information run backwards in time? He says, Roger Penrose, who is a physicist from England, first suggested that quantum effects in the brain could explain backwards referral. and that such efforts may occur commonly, even routinely. So he's trying to pinpoint where it occurs. Yes, that he's saying it very well could. It turns out that in quantum mechanics, quantum information can indeed run backwards or be time indeterminate. And this is what, what he calls the, the Aronoff formulation. Um, or he doesn't call it this, he's referring to the Aronoff formulation, which is, a description in quantum mechanics in terms of causal relation in which the present is caused by quantum states of the past and of the future taken in, in combination. So time is a really slippery, really slippery idea. And there is experimental evidence for this. In uh, the Netherlands, 
uh, Radon and Berman did skin conductance on an, uh, to me measure physiological responses in, in subjects. They found that subjects responded strongly to emotional images compared to neutral images. And that the emotional response occurred between a fraction of a second to several seconds before the image appeared. So here you are, you've got a, you've got a subject waiting for uh, some image to, to flash on a screen. But before the image actually flashes, the response is there and they can measure it. And it, they found that up to four seconds before the stimuli is actually administered, the response comes. Now, how do you explain that? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just, I, I just, it's very interesting. Um, I want to switch now over to the, uh, the spiritual side of things because, um, and I'm going to stick with, uh, pretty much mostly with the Dalai Lama. The notion of intrinsic independent existence is incompatible with causation. This is because causation implies contingency independence, while anything that possesses independent existence would be immutable and self-enclosed. Oh, well, here it is. Everything is composed of dependently related events of continuously interacting phenomena with no fixed immutable essence. Things and events are empty in that they do not possess any immutable essence, intrinsic reality, or absolute being that affords independence. This fundamental truth of the way things are is described in the Buddhist writings as emptiness or shunyatya in Sanskrit. The world, according to the philosophy of emptiness, is constituted by a web of dependently originating and interconnected events, which dependently originated causes give rise to dependently, within which, excuse me, dependently originated causes give rise to dependently originated consequences, according to dependently originating laws of causality. Now, everything is connected, in other words. Everything is connected. I don't know, how many of you, does anybody here watch uh, Dirk Gently's Holistic uh, Detective? Oh, okay. Well, that's what they keep saying in there. Everything is connected. Okay. This is our Swami Yogatmananda from uh, Providence. He put it very succinctly. Space is distinction in objects. Time is distinction in events without limits of space and time. I am everywhere. I love it. And Srinasargadatta. Sargadatta. Clinging to the false makes the true so difficult to see. Once you understand that the false needs time, and what needs time is false, you are nearer to reality. So I think the conclusion of modern physics, the most modern physics, is pretty clear. The answer to the question, what is reality, is actually the opposite of what the ancients defined, that is the prevailing notion of what the ancients defined, and they come up with insubstantiality. Reality is really insubstantial. It's not the prevailing notion of matter being reality. Looking ahead, uh, I have this quote from Max Planck, all matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. Now Schrodinger was, uh, excuse me, um, Planck was pre-Einstein. I mean, he was actually a older colleague of, of Einstein. So I would like to look into this idea of uh, mind, intelligent mind. But that means we have to go forward and have other parts to the talk, which is, I have a few things here. Uh, holographic universe and the self, or quantum mechanics, black holes and the observer, and finally evolution, involution, and origination. These, if I have time, 
uh, and are, am slotted into the speaking schedule. We'll talk about these various other kinds of things. Uh, not by themselves. We're trying to get a spiritual handle on all of this. So in conclusion,